This is Hyperbole Medical at The Square. Dental services, phlebotomy and radiology are located along the corridor to your left. You can enter the pharmacy from the waiting room or foyer. We regret any delays, but we are experiencing high service demands. Give your name at the desk and take a seat, though it is important to mention if you are suffering bleeding, a new rash, chest pains or shortness of breath. While you wait, take the time to enjoy a healthy snack or tea at the Corpus Cafe. A doctor will see you as soon as possible. Today, your heart will beat 86,400 times. Discovering again how green Mary's eyes are and the soft rose of her blush almost makes forgetting worthwhile. You will filter 25,000 litres of oxygen from 121,000 litres of air. Send it in millions of red bubbles through miles of artery to the 656 muscles that move 206 bones. The booby-trapped hallway didn't get me today. I negotiated his minefield of discarded shoes completely unscathed. You will lift tons standing, sitting, walking, running downstairs, even if you move nothing but your own body. I seemed flung out of sleep this morning, landed disorientated, dizzy. It was only her body in the bed that anchored me. You will do all this on autopilot. You will not notice, for instance, that while you slept, your fingernails grew nearly one-tenth of a millimetre. Tugging out grey hairs in the mirror is a small daily ritual of hope. I like to defy futility. You won't recognise which muscles contract as you walk, or how your tendons stretch. In the bathroom I twisted to see all of my reflection, memorising my silhouette while it's still the proper shape. Nor the force with which the blood is impelled through your arteries. As I cooked breakfast, I pretended I was a ninja, fast, deadly, silent, nobody noticed. Success, I suppose. You certainly won't perceive the expansion of lungs, the rise and fall of ribcage. Taste the rich soup of your breath. The gilding sun made her face shine, so brightly I could barely inhale. So I held her, breathless until she wriggled from my arms to make tea. You will not stop, even for a moment, to wonder at the complex integration of form and functionality that is the machine we all drive. As light crawled through the crack in the threadbare curtains, I was washed into wakefulness on the tide of her breath. For a moment it swamped me, and I knew I would drown. But as the engine ticks over, your heart will beat 86,400 times. Give or take a skip or two. My Aunt Olive was a vocal proponent of the stiff upper lip, of staring the world straight in the face and showing it what you are made of. No truth. No downcast gaze. No. Never an admission of regret. It was eyes front, anything behind unchangeable. If ghosts follow. The translucent shades of uncle's casual infidelities. A phantom of the bankruptcy so painstakingly buried. The tiny spectre of their stillborn son. If these things stopped her, she would rather not see. She sat in front in the chapel of rest, rigid, facing forward. She listened to her children eulogize their father. Seeming unbowed, she watched the minister's bald spot as he led prayers. Because she never looked over her shoulder, nobody could have expected her to turn as she did to salt, to crumble. My daughter's hair, this week a bilious shade of green, has been cerise, cerulean. 
Marigold, indigo, emo black, worn with shroud pale makeup and a studied air of boredom. For one single disorientating month, it was a brown that might have been natural. You should take better care of your body, I say. I remind her skin is the largest organ. My glance pierces like the metal through nose, lip, eyebrow, like a needle full of ink. She adjusts her collar to cover the tattooed fritillary that perches at the junction of neck and shoulder. An undeniable masterpiece, this butterfly tattoo. A slick black ribbon forms the scalloped edges of the forewing, the trailing sweep of the hind. Studded with vivid orange ovals, it frames a segmented sapphire centre shaded with the delicacy of an old master. Though I mainly picture the point stabbing my daughter hundreds and thousands of times, I see beads of blood. I see my own repeated failures. She slides a mug in front of me. Trim milk, she says. She offers this evidence of self-care like a flag of truce. I watch the coffee settle, smooth as newly healed skin. Pale and fragile, but entire. This is hyperbole medical at the square. Gentle when properly positioned in relation to, need I say it? Her. I'm a gyroscope. Poised. Grave. Centred. But sometimes she isn't where she's supposed to be in relation to, need I say it? Me. Any shift in the vestibular space that joins us throws me off kilter, robs me of the fixed point I balance on and sends me whirling through a maze of twisting uncertainties. I get dizzy, nauseated. None of this would happen if she'd just stay where I put her. English archaeologists found it at an isolated forest site, nestled neatly inside the skeleton's hip cavity. Deliberately decapitated, says the Herald. His lonely bones, bleached and bare, allow us a lunch hour's conversation. The newspaper between us, half a world, half a day away. His end, its brutality, desiccated, stripped and cleansed by time and distance, too long, too far from understanding of reasons or allocation of blame, distracts us from the smaller, fresher violences that injure our days. This month's argument is empty-headed as any ancient skull. My mobile bill, his pointless overtime, or last night's soup bones, shredded flesh, stripped away, burning to the pan, a hiss of recrimination. Moments of forgetfulness were once matter for laughter. A philosophical shrug, an angler's tale of a flashing silver side that slipped off the hook of memory. Mary and I could sit alongside the stream of conversation, enjoying it like the sun and soft afternoon air, content to let the current carry a word away. Another would soon be by. Now I cast and cast. I struggle to hook and haul each wriggling, reluctant idea, knock it on the head and mount it where I can see it. Some are gone already. Mary speaks of prince nymphs tied together on the table in Turangi, of a campfire trout on the Tongariro's banks, and I smile as if at a reflection that glimpse only rippled surface, memory sunk beneath. And I cast against the approaching day I come to the river without bait, or sit in the garden, rod in hand, wondering why there is no water. I broke my big toe when I was 24. Drunk. Wet floor. A sliding, sobering, foot-first collision with an adobe wall. It swelled and purpled in hours. But a week later, the only evidence of injury was a yellow-black shadow. Still, the osteopath told me in a voice like my father's, such damage really never heals. It's not a disablement, but now and then, I misstep. A stabbing reminder of what will always be broken. 
I never told Dad. At first, too embarrassed. Then too late. So now I step gingerly through his absence until I hear Satchmo, smell Glenfiddich, see a polished fossil, the perfect gift for Dad. Or until, like today, I want him to bark, pull yourself together, miss. And that creaking, cigarette-scrubbed authoritarian voice. I'll never hear it again, though. So I must grit my teeth, limp for a while, stumble on. I, S E, A R C H F, O R F L A W, S I N P E R F E C, T G E. M S ampersand I A L W A Y S F I N D T H E M The stinging nettle prickle beneath my skin, the sweat blossom between my breasts. The struggling for breath that drags any air reaching my lungs through 14 layers of filtering muslin. Call it hormones. Call the lightheadedness oxygen deprivation. The tendency to blush hot flashes. Say, it's very common in women of a certain age. Don't answer when they ask how old. Call the sudden sharp urge to fuck a yearning for youth. A midlife crisis. Work through it clinging to and looking over familiar shoulders. Breathe your tight, urgent gasps into familiar ears. Call that particular familiarity by its true name, love, so you can call the other aberration madness. Call it hormones. Ignore the stimulus, the presence that prompts the symptoms. Call that coincidence. Just don't call it desire. Don't call it attraction. Foolish woman, old woman, don't call it lust. He will not smile as he invites me to sit, taps keys, studies my medical history on the screen that doesn't quite perch between us, isn't quite barrier but nonetheless protects him. It's not the roiling of my stomach he'll ask about, not the dread rising like acid to my throat, not the queasiness I pretend is condition, not symptom. These are not things that concern him today. Instead he'll... God. Confirm that blue cross Relay with conscientious attention to medical detail, position, prognosis, each upcoming procedure. I, unheeding, will fold hands tight across my churning guts. Try not to read the future in the way they twist. You know the place. Right at the centre of the collarbones, where neck becomes chest. Yeah, that's it. That hollow. The name is all wrong. I want to find a word less edged and osseous. One that nods to scented skin. The pulse beneath. I want a better word too, for the sound she makes each time I kiss there. The one that washes like a wave across her barely parted lips. Not sigh. Not whimper or gasp. It bothers me, this nameless exhalation. I need names to mark territories. Without, I lack the means to navigate to our comfortable hollow and sail in circles for fear of breaking on reefs of bone. If I tighten every muscle, I can still bend over backwards. 
when occasion, when family demand it, I can still be flexible. The trouble is, once there, I'm sure that standing up for myself, turning upright again, will shatter something unfixable. I get seasick looking at the world from this improbable angle, but really, Doctor, what's a little discomfort compared to the crushing alternative? The technical term for a vocal cord weakness is paresis. Symptoms, shortness of breath, hoarseness, inaudibility. The voice, despite something to say, to shriek, struggles to escape the constricting throat. Wikipedia, my grandchildren's reference source of choice, ascribes many causes. Viruses, tumours, compression of nerves through intubation, or even the splendidly sonorous laryngopharyngeal reflux. Well, hard enough to pronounce when one's voice is cooperating. It mentions trauma too. I wonder if this confirmation of the thing dreaded, the slow, random erasure of self, like a whiteboard in a corridor brushed by passing shoulders, counts as trauma even if not sudden and far from unexpected, because God knows my voice was struggling and all that would come after the strained and stretching silence was three ragged, ridiculous words. Thank you, Doctor. A doctor will see you as soon as possible.